Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Appreciate you uh, attending Ritu's uh, next installment of our Lunch and Learns. Uh, here today with me is Kelly Kramer to present on safety in the oil and gas industry. Wanted to just take a few moments to cover some specifics up front. Uh, you'll note uh, in the uh, the particular upfront considerations here, uh, we're going to start with a safety moment. Uh, currently with the conditions outside, at least here locally in Pennsylvania, uh, where I'm at, heat has continued to increase throughout the week. Uh, please keep in mind heat stress conditions, uh, especially when fostered with PPE, with your FRs, hard hat, potential respirators uh, due to COVID-19 conditions uh, at this time. Please make certain to keep that in overall consideration. Uh, continuing education credits, uh, as noted in the invite, we are offering PDH credits with this. Uh, if you have not uh, contacted Lynn Reed, uh, the information is there below to send an email to assure you get those PDH credits. Um, for purposes of this online session, uh, there is a dialog box uh, at your bottom toolbar to provide question and answer. Um, Kelly's going to indicate further about the uh, interaction throughout the program, so please uh, use that to submit your questions and we'll provide answers thereafter. And with that, I will turn it over to, uh, to Mr. Kramer. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, good reminder on the heat stress. Uh, I just want to say thank you uh, for everybody's time and for this opportunity. Um, a quick introduction. I'm the manager of safety training at RITU. I've been here for about eight years and um, help our company as well as others, uh, probably mostly construction, uh, with uh, the whole gamut of safety. Uh, so on site safety uh, training, uh, writing programs, uh, all those types of things. Uh, prior to that, I uh, worked uh, with a drilling company for about 12 years, uh, helping them as well with uh, their safety program. So there's probably others, but that's good enough, I believe, uh, for this uh, for this uh, lunch and learn. So thank you. Uh, we have about 45. Kelly, 45 sorry, one, yeah, one other thing, if I could interject, sorry. Um, Absolutely. You know, folks, again, to the, the purpose of the, the safety specifics that we're going to cover here today, I guess I'll give a little bit further of an intro there. Um, there has been some, some decline naturally with uh, participation in the industry. Um, however, there has been an increase in, in case studies and, and deaths and fatalities, as well as other substantial injuries throughout the industry. And, and we felt it important to cover a number of these topics and case studies um, to, to show some of the areas where there's been shortcomings, uh, hopefully to provide some additional influence and insight to the industry where, um, you know, other operators and, and you as functioning individuals in the industry um, can maybe help to advance uh, some of these shortcomings and help to, again, participate in cutting down on those lost days, lost times, or, or potential substantial injury. Yeah, thanks. That's that's 100% accurate, Jeremy. And we do have some really important, really good information with some case studies. Uh, so a, uh, a little bit of an expectation to, to, to pay attention. And, and most importantly, with the, uh, I looked over the attendees list, there's some, a lot of experience uh, on that list, and I would like you to to, uh, uh, to submit questions and share uh, with that wealth of experience. And then lastly, uh, hopefully uh, that you learn something as a result of today. And if you do, I ask that you apply it. Uh, otherwise, the time you spent here was a little bit of a waste of time. So that's the expectations and our goals for today. Um, I'm going to start with a slide that maybe doesn't paint the prettiest picture of, of what can happen. Uh, currently, uh, in 2015, there was a peak in the oil and gas uh, uh, industry in terms of, of employment and personnel. That has been on a, uh, on a downward uh, side in terms of numbers of people. Uh, with that said, the fatality rates have been uh, just the opposite, uh, which is not at all what you want to see. Uh, at that peak at 2015, there was 120 fatalities uh, in the oil and gas industry. Uh, most recent data from the from the Bureau of Labor and Statistics uh, is an increase up to 130. So approximately a 10% increase, even though there's been a uh, decline in the number of employees. Uh, so that's that's kind of a little bit of the background. Uh, also, what can happen? I just share briefly a uh, more personal story. 
of an individual that I've known uh, for about nine or 10 years. I uh, was involved in a really serious incident about three years ago or four years ago uh, where he um, was doing work for a utility contractor and he attended a uh, Friday morning safety meeting, a tailgate meeting, which they do every Friday and uh, went back to resume his tasks that that morning and uh, that included going in to uh, take some measurements on a manhole that they had set the day before uh, to make sure that everything was was uh, where it needed to be before they backfilled it and uh, other other uh, co-worker of his goes over gets in the excavator uh, as he's taking a measurement on that manhole and he uh, fired that up and when he moved that he spun that around and the counter swing uh, caught Jason uh, that's him pictured there in that in that photo uh, when it did that it took him or uh, in his words corkscrewed him across the top of that manhole and tore off his left leg and did some spinal damage uh, he currently is paralyzed and he's in a, a wheelchair to this day um, and has had lots and lots of adversity that he's had to face over the last three or four years. So uh, when I ask what can happen, you know, that's our goal today is to not uh, have experiences like that and also maybe not contribute to that uh, increase in fatality rates. Uh, I don't think any of us would like to go through anything uh, anywhere close to that. And speaking with him, I, I know I don't. So the question uh, is, what can we do? Um, our, my my goal today is is to to prevent those kind of injuries, and more importantly, you know, what can your company do, or what can you do uh, to prevent those types of injuries? Um, we use uh, here at Ritu a stoplight as our uh, uh, symbol as a reminder of something that you can do to help yourself out. Uh, what we've found in the industry is most times people know what they're supposed to do. Uh, safety, uh, we hear it all the time, is common sense. And uh, statistically, 80% of the time people knew exactly what they were supposed to do. And so I'll share uh, Jason's comment when I spoke to him after he came out of a, a 13 month uh, hospitalization part of which was in a coma. Uh, he shared that, uh, you know, I'd asked him when after he was struck what what he would have done differently. And he said, uh, he said, I just kind of got in a hurry and I just didn't think that that was going to happen. But he said, I knew exactly what I was supposed to do. I just didn't do it. So that's to me, that's the key. Uh, you know, before we do something, stop and think about what you're getting ready to do uh, before you begin that activity, that task or that job. Uh, stop and assess the risk and you can do that by just simply asking what can go wrong uh, and maybe even prioritize that. Uh, so what is the worst thing that could possibly happen? Because uh, there may be several things that could go wrong. So that's that's the uh, you know the assessment of the risk or the assessment of the hazards portion of the controls uh, represented by that red light. The, the next part then is the the yellow or you know the caution part uh, so uh, we dedicate that part to uh, figuring out what controls we have in place and uh, what can we do if uh, to add to those controls that maybe aren't already in place so do i have the training do i have the knowledge uh, do i have all the tools all the protective equipment and if not you know what things do i need to uh, to get in place, which leads us to that third part of that light, which is the the uh, the action part, so the important part. Um, so represented by that green, as we said earlier, 80 percent of the time people know what they're supposed to do. They just didn't do it uh, for a number of reasons, right? You sometimes you get in a hurry, you get complacent, you just forgot you know, wh whatever that is. But you know, if we if we kind of go through that logic and that process, uh, we would prevent a lot of things from happening. And and I know 100% uh, after talking with Jason that if he would have just simply done these things, uh, also the operator that was with him, uh, he was a um, mid 50s, if I had to guess his age, been working for that company for 21 years, running equipment for 21 of those. And, and he had similar errors 
Uh, one of the things he just simply didn't do was walk around that machine prior to entering it. And if he would have simply done that uh, prior to going in there, he would have seen Jason back there and not struck him. Uh, so that's that's our uh, kind of our steps and our control measures to figure out or maybe prevent these types of things from happening. Uh, a big component of that is is identifying the hazards. And so what I what I'd hope to do and um, maybe have uh, take a minute or so for you to submit some of your hazards uh, is is for you to let me know what you do, what what hazards you you face. Uh, I do have a list here in case nobody responds, uh, but uh, I'll give you a uh, a minute or so to submit your your comments to to Jeremy. And then now I'll, I'll try to use those uh, in some examples throughout the uh, the next 40 minutes. And Kelly, this is Jeremy. While uh, while everybody's submitting their questions there through the IM component at the bottom, uh, I think again a, a necessary component to to step back there on the prior slide is is about self action. You know, we go through a number of these case studies that are coming up. This this is all self performing uh, on on your onus and individual nature yourself. Yeah, you know, we put has IDs together. We put safety plans and JSAs and daily tailgate safeties, and that's great. That that's that's fantastic. But you yourself uh, need to take priority and act in those fashions to to secure your safety alone um, at the end of the day. So I think that's a a key component that we'll see at the end of this that had individuals themselves uh, taken the action necessary, there was probably better outcomes. How are we looking for uh, questions there or comments, Jeremy? All right, we got uh, one gas production related, natural gas construction, explosives, LELs, chemicals, um, you know, typical natural gas production related issues. I got another one here, Kelly, uh, regarding uh, slips, trips, falls. Um, Very good. We've got. Uh, uh it looks to be about it for the time being okay i appreciate those that, that submitted those answers and i was uh, hoping that my answers matched up with yours because we we sort of pr prepared this with some of those in mind uh slips and falls def definitely on the list and it is uh, every year one of the top uh, causes of injury uh, again it was last year i think it came in at second or third um, Vehicle collisions consider, continue to be in the top uh, every year. Uh, explosions, uh, somebody had submitted there. So yes, there, certainly. So I'm gonna, I'll focus in on some of these. I'm going to focus on, on a couple struck by a caught between uh, as well, uh, since that's a, a pretty big contributor to those fatalities uh, each year. Uh, those are the fatal four and electrical is usually in there as well. So. Kelly, I did get uh, two others as well, lockout, tag out, and oh, uh, cold in our field as well. So some of those biological yeah. uh, components filing in there as well. Excellent. Good. I think we'll be able to sort of roll all those in in, in some of these examples. So thank you. Uh, so kind of circling back, um, you know, to con controlling the hazards and kind of going through that that logic to, uh, to assess the hazards. Uh, the best way uh, to control hazards uh, is to figure out how to avoid them completely. Uh, so you guys mentioned slips and falls. So if I don't go up on a rooftop, my chances of falling to my death from a roof are pretty slim. Uh, that may simplify a little bit, but that's it can be that simple. Uh, so anytime you uh, you do something and you recognize there's a hazard there, you want to ask yourself that question is, do I have to do it or do I have to do it this way? And you can see a picture there in this uh, slide. Uh, that that operator is having a bad day. Uh, that was a recent incident uh, where the person was doing some work at an oil and gas site, uh, some excavating for a pipeline uh, on a slope. And as they worked throughout the day, uh, all the disturbance, uh, they were uh, doing some hoe ram, uh, chopping away at some rock there, and also, of course, excavating and moving back and forth. They had um, taken a pretty wet uh, soil condition and made it worse. Uh, they were also on a slope, so. Uh, at some point there, they got stuck and they got the operator tried to push himself back. And when he did that, he started to slide down the hill, slid about 40 feet and then tipped, literally tipped over onto his side. Uh, so that so the severity wasn't uh, as bad as it looks. Um, he was not injured. Um, 
he was uh, he had a seatbelt on the ROPS did its job and, and no no harm to the individual the operator. Um, there were some people on site. Uh, there were three other operators there. Uh, they, they were called spotters. I'll call them um, spectators. Uh, but they uh, they were not in the line of fire and they were not injured either. Uh, but yeah, the question is asked is do you have to do it this way? You know that if it, if the conditions are that bad, maybe the answer is no. We don't do that today. Uh, if you did have to do it that day, uh, or you felt you had to do it that day, that might lead to our next control, which would be an engineering control. Uh, this particular contractor did have a winch plan um, and it did involve a slope angle, but that slope angle at that site wasn't quite met. So therefore they didn't have to, to implement that uh, winch control plan. Um, so, you know, maybe we look at that and uh, looking back on it, obviously they should have, or you know, they probably should have uh, whatever winch plan they had it didn't work. So uh, moving down the line here, administrative controls, um, you know, so how can we adjust our work practices? Uh, so, you know, that would be like JSAs, that would be walking the site, uh, having having qualified operators, a competent person on site, assessing the soil conditions. Uh, they they did not have a lot of those things. They did perform a JSA, but they did not assess the soil conditions. They did not have a competent person on site. Um, and so, you know, that, you know, probably contributed significantly to that to that incident. Uh, had they done that or had that, they probably would have assessed that condition and uh, you know, did a stop work and then uh, maybe go on to that to that winch control plan or maybe even stopped work altogether that day. Uh, Kelly, as as regarding, regarding that JSA that they had uh, supplied, did it have uh, you know site specific uh, daily update or was it more of a generalistic uh, check the box uh, pencil I, with the kind of endeavor? I, I kind of get the, the feeling that it might have been slightly pencil whipped. Uh, I don't know that 100% uh, uh, possibly from the fact that they did identify a competent person, but you know, they didn't assess conditions of soil. So I mean, um, so there was parts of it that were there, but it didn't seem like everything got got done properly. So I don't know if it was a fact that they just got rushed or if it was the the JSA you know, format or but. But that certainly would be something to look at, right? Make sure that we're not pencil whipping those. Yeah, and I, I think key takeaway here, you know, in, in the remainder of these case studies are things that we become uh, a little preoccupied with. We copy HASPs over from a prior job and, and we don't make them site specific or regional or geographically specific uh, to what's going on. Same way with those JSAs, right? We pull the one from the day prior. Uh, mark a new date on it, sign your name at the bottom sometimes. Uh, we, we have seen that consistently um, across not only you know things that RITU has assessed, but I think in the industry as a whole uh, and need to pay a little bit more attention to, to truly diving into those and, and making them solid up front. Yeah, one thing you will note from these uh, case studies is, is many of them do support that 80% you know, that, that people kind of know what to do. Uh, you know, we know how to do a JSA. I think most people in this call would. Uh, for some reason, we just don't always do it or we don't, we don't do it uh, thoroughly. Um, so, you know, that, that action part is really key. So moving on to the next case study, um, you know, is working around heavy equipment. Um, I know in the oil and gas industry, lots and lots of heavy equipment uh, struck by is one of the most common uh, fatalities uh, in our industry. And so I thought maybe what we would do is sort of talk through the uh, the case with uh, with Jason's example. Uh, this is about where he was standing uh, when he was struck by the counter swing of the excavator. He was a little bit closer than this, but this is about where his angle was at the time. Um, and you can see the operator's vantage point there uh, that pretty much has no uh, no visibility to uh, to where Jason was standing. So, you know, do I have to do it or do I have to do it this way? Uh, like I mentioned with uh, with the interview with with Jason, when I asked him what he thought the first the thing that he could have done to prevent this, his very first response without hesitation was there's no way I should have been where I was. I should have never been standing there. Uh, didn't even hesitate, didn't blame the operator, even though he was partially to blame. Yes, yeah, so that's a question, right? 
do I have to do this or do I have to do it this way? Uh, engineering controls. Now, of course, they're going to have some equipment that has backup cameras. Uh, that particular one that uh, that day did not, uh, but they do have mirrors, but you know, mirrors have limitations. You know, so you know, design or build of things within the equipment to maybe reduce that uh, the chance for something to, to happen. Uh, administrative controls uh, coming to the operator side of things. Uh, that operator clearly did not walk around that machine, and that's an example of an administrative control. Um, you know, having a procedure in place that you're supposed to do or having a spotter, uh, which they did not have. Uh, both things which would have prevented this. And then lastly, I don't know what protective equipment would prevent that kind of situation but, or any any uh, heavy equipment related situation other than maybe a high vis vest to, to, you know, to be visible. Um, you know, seat belt, I guess, if it rolled over in the last example, uh, but th those don't prevent the incident, right? You can still be hit with a high vis vest. In fact, Jason had high vis clothing on when he was uh, when he was uh, um, had his amputation. So that that obviously was not very effective. Kelly, regarding that uh, that case study yet, and maybe you'll be getting into it here. I think there was some uh, some things that had taken place on that site once 911 was dialed um, and possibly missed information. You'd be covering that as well. Yeah. I'd I did make a note here. Um, one thing that they uh, that we learned after that incident happened, uh, the the foreman on the site uh, made the 911 call, and he was very uh, brief in his 911 call. He basically said, "We have a man who was struck by a piece of equipment, and uh, he's in serious condition." And based on that, they dispatched um, two uh, female EMTs, uh, and that was it. And uh, Jason's about six one, probably two, I don't know, two sixty, a pretty big guy. And when he was struck, he was pushed down into a manhole, so he was, you know, about four or five feet down in a hole, basically, um, and in and in real serious condition. So it it got real serious, real ugly, uh, even after the fact, uh, in the uh, attempted extraction of him from that from that uh, um, manhole. Uh, so they learned that when you make that call, you got to be more, um, you know, more explanatory in what happened and where you are, and you know, so, so you know, having that detailed uh, emergency action plan, you know, thinking what you're going to do if something does happen, uh, training to re to review those types of things with your employees, uh, all certainly would have helped that. So yeah, thanks for bringing that up, Jeremy. Uh, here's some of the the answers you know that would have uh, prevented that type of thing is controlling site access, uh, backup alarms or cameras, uh, mirrors, windows adjusted and clean, uh, daily meetings, JSAs, uh, qualified operators, um, of course alert, you're not texting. And then lastly, uh, one thing that certainly would have helped here was nonverbal communication uh, or just communication. Uh, if he'd have let the operator know he was going behind there or if the operator would have, would have walked around and um, you know they would have communicated that hey i'm back here i'm in the way uh, so that's probably the big one that didn't happen there along with uh not being there and kelly we had talked earlier you know in this case you had a qualified operator um in, in this case you know they as a team had worked together for quite some time you know, jason put himself in that position although he knew he shouldn't have been in that position so it goes back to although you can have documents you can have plans uh, you yourself need to control your your fate at points and times and, and could have been completely avoided by not continuing that practice for what it was yeah. that yeah he took complete ownership of that uh you know that incident he know he knew he was you know even though the other the other act definitely contributed to it he didn't even he didn't even go there so moving on to case study two i'm going to actually let let the, the group do a little bit of work here um, i'm a safety guy i don't like to do a lot of work my boss can tell you that uh, case study number two uh, i'll share what happened and then you guys can tell me what you think uh, maybe using that that same progression uh, what could have prevented this? Uh, so the description was they were relocating a 28 foot piece of pipe, 16 inch diameter steel pipe uh, using the bucket of an excavator. So you 
uh, scooped up under the, the uh, pipe with the uh, teeth and with the bucket, lifted it off the ground. Uh, the pipe became unbalanced, and when it did that, it, it slid. Uh, of course, when it slid, it slid right into the cab. Uh, fortunately, it didn't strike the operator. It uh, caused the, it, it did in fact, though, cause the uh, foot pedals to become engaged in the, tra and the excavator tracked forward. Of course, pushed the pipe in even further then at that point and did more damage. Same thing though, no injuries um, as a result of all that. So using that hierarchy of control and that uh, um, sort of stoplight approach, uh, what do you uh, maybe maybe send a few of your answers into uh, to Jeremy and we'll see what you come up with here. Sorry, you got on mute to talk these days, I guess. Um, I got one here, uh, assessment of site conditions. It looks like the pipe was muddy and slippery. Yep, that, that definitely contributed to the, uh, the sliding of the pipe for sure. That's a good answer. Uh, preparedness of plans for lifting uh, of equipment on site. Yeah, who whoever wrote that in there? Yeah, they did not have a a, uh, a lift plan. So you know, typically with crane operations, now this isn't a crane, but it was a excavator being used as a crane. Uh, that is a you know a real common um, requirement of most companies. So yeah, that's a good answer too. Any others come in there, Jeremy? Uh, the only other one was uh, qualified, you know, operator and, and qualified operations support. Very good, excellent. Yeah, those those were pretty much what what um, the findings were as well. Uh, so going through that that same progression there, does it have to be done, or does it have to be done this way? Uh, in that in that industry, in the oil and gas industry, the piping industry, you all know that that's real common. You're not going to use a crane typically for this type of lift. Uh, so. Uh, now, did it have to be lifted with the bucket, though, uh, the way it was? And I'm going to say no, it did not. Um, I'm gonna, which leads us to the engineering control. That should have been lifted with a uh, rated lifting strap, perhaps with a choker hitch on that uh, to prevent some of that sliding that the one gentleman or lady talked about there. Uh, that would have stabilized that load, um, been able to center it up, it, of course, with incapacity, so it's a rated lifting strap. They did, in fact, have lifting straps on site that were of capacity to perform that work, but they didn't use them. Um, so they had them on site for something, but they just didn't use them. Uh, administrative controls, they did, in fact, form, perform a JSA again uh, in this one, Jeremy, uh, but they, they did not have a qualified rigor on site. Now, that's typically a crane uh, requirement, but I would submit that that whether you're lifting that pipe with a crane or a, 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 a backo or a traco, it's all the same, right? You're still using clevises, you're still using certified anchor points, you're still using lifting hardware um, and lifting straps and the like. So, you know, you would want somebody there that's trained and knows what they're doing and, and can do that, uh, I guess, legally and effectively. So that's a qualified person, right? By training or by experience. And then spotters uh, require tagline. Anytime you're lifting anything overhead, tagline helps you sort of stabilize the load. They did not have taglines in place. Um, again, as far as PPE, I don't know. You know, gloves maybe I guess for handling the load, but really nothing. And and high vis vests for uh, uh, hard hats. But if something goes like that, good luck. You know, right? hard hats or gloves or not. Uh, so that's that's case study two. Did any more come in, Jeremy, uh, while I was co talking, commenting? Uh, no, sir, that was all. OK. Well, we'll move on then to case study number three. And uh, I would be remiss if we didn't talk about COVID-19 for at least a few minutes today. Uh, I think it's probably uh, something that's been on everybody's mind, whether you want it to be or not. And, and we are seeing that from the safety side uh, for sure. Uh, this particular uh, picture, if you look closely at that, you can see a safety glasses. And if you've worn a, uh, a mask currently, 
and and with uh, safety glasses, you know exactly what happens. Uh, they fog up. Uh, if you're out in the heat, you know exactly how that feels. Um, so uh, we're seeing that across the board. And and how important is it to be able to see? Uh, you know, I'd say that's probably uh, one of the most important uh, of our senses. Uh, that and our ability to talk and communicate. Uh, without those, life becomes very difficult. So that's a critical part of our day-to-day uh, -day task uh, and to be able to do that safely. So um, I would ask is, does it have to be done just like our, our progression has gone all along here, or does it have to be done this way? So that sort of depends, I guess, right? Um, so it depends on your site, depends on what you're doing. We have had multiple cases right now um, two safety directors that I've done work with this past week uh, where they were uh, successfully able to do some modifications to their site to make this work. Um, and it was due to the heat last week or two weeks ago, I guess now. Uh, the first one, um, they were able to go to PennDOT and um, get approval to, as long as they can maintain physical distancing to not wear those masks. So if they were outside and they were able to maintain physical distance, they could go without masks on all of the Pennsylvania PennDOT roads currently for that particular contractor. So they were submitted to the to the state, got it, got a written authorization to do that. Um, the other ones, uh, the other person did it. They went through the governor, uh, didn't have much success for this. So they went to the Pennsylvania Department of Labor and Industry and got uh, approval. Um, same thing, physical distancing. They could prove that the mask was going to create a greater hazard of a, such as heat stress uh, that they wouldn't have to do that. Now, what they found, though, is that they couldn't always maintain that physical distancing. Uh, so talking with their employees and through their observations, they saw that. And so what they were able to do then is add um, face shields instead of face masks in those cases. Um, so much less fogging up. The, the employees um, complained a lot less about them uh, due to the heat, you know, and they could see better. And so that, you know, coming back to that first question is, do we do we have to do it this way, like the guy up in the upper left, or do we have, can we do it another way, right? And so two different cases, one where they went away from masks completely based on the conditions and the hazards, and this one where they uh, sort of modified it and went to uh, face shields. And in that case, you know, there was something that could be bought or built. Uh, those, they weren't hard hats anyway. Um, they, you know, each employee was given one of those or the ones that, that needed those or one of those, uh, they were able to buy those. Of course, working differently, you know, you may plan your tasks so that you can stay six feet, you know, make, make that, uh, try to keep that physical distancing. And then that lands us right to the PPE that would be necessary then, you know, based on those hazards. So I don't know if anybody, since that's sort of a topical item right now, if anybody has any questions, I'd say submit those to uh, to Jeremy and we'll maybe try to address that. Uh, one thing though I can I can tell you from our experience on this particular case or these cases is what made that successful or made that work is uh, the fact that both, both of the sites that I'm aware of had uh, pandemic safety officers, uh, compliance safety officers on site. Uh, so they had a representative there that was that was full time. They were dedicated to that task and uh, they were talking to the employees, right? And the employees brought that hazard up to them. Uh, they were able to address that hazard and, and not just, you know, they took it to all the way to the governor, right? They took it up to the uh, highest level of uh, command in the state of Pennsylvania. Now they didn't have success there. And even though they didn't have success there, they did not stop, right? They went to somebody else. So I, I would encourage you as one of the things we can do is bring those hazards up, right? Bring them up to the person that can affect some change. Um, and the fact that if you have safety people, you know, make sure they're worth something, uh, that they're able to take action. Hey, Kelly, this is Jeremy. I, I do have yeah. a couple of questions that came in during those topics, uh, but but one other thing was the, the advocacy for your employees or, or for your personnel. You know, I think one of the things that had contributed back to some of those initial numbers that you had put up there was dilution of the uh, the safety involvement on the front end. Um, you know, things got hot and heavy in the industry. 
uh, might have had multiple projects, multiple crews running with, uh, you know, people all over the place. And safety was one of those where you may end up with a single safety advisor for, you know, a 100 mile project or 50 mile project. I'm ambiguous there with my distances and numbers, but long and short is, uh, you know, if you have someone out on site or a foreman or a super or a safety advisor that can advocate for your personnel, for your staff, um, to help address new ways to, to go about things, just like this situation with the masks versus the shields, um, seems to be a big part of, you know, helping advise and govern those scenarios to cut back on some of the fatalities and, and further influence of uh, severe safety impacts. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's for sure, Jeremy. Having a good, having a good advocate, uh, you know, that's willing to go to bat for you makes a big difference. Kelly, to a uh, couple of the questions that came in here, and we'll field them, I guess, as we go forward. Um, ha has there been considerations for the shields uh, versus mask due to heat as well? Yes. Um, there's a Pennsylvania Department of Labor and Industry. Just, I just got an email the other day um, that basically says if you can prove that there's a, um, enough hazard with the heat that you could go to the face shields, that that is acceptable practice. Okay. And the other question that did come in was, uh, is there specific distancing or recommendations for distancing to be maintained during breaks? Um, I, I don't know that. I'm going to say, you know, consistent with the CDC six feet, but uh, I would assume you would just carry that same that same uh, recommendation coming from them uh, during breaks. That is a tough time where we've seen problems, though. You know, where they're really good about it during the dip, during the workday, and then break time, everybody just sort of gathers together like they always do and uh, sits there sometimes even with their out their mask on because they're eating and they're you know they're right next to each other <laughs> yep um, and then the uh, the other question that came in was uh, regarding face masks or shield and the ability to reuse or circulate um, yeah. during the work week uh, you want to sanitize them um, you know but and I would I would recommend that you you know keep your own use your own uh, for that purpose. Yeah, I know I wouldn't want to use the mask after you used it, Jeremy, if I could avoid <laughs> that. Um, and Kelly, I think there's some guidance out there about uh, the, the duration of which uh, the, the virus lasts outside of the, the human body and, and circulating masks of your, your own use or own ownership. Um, can you cover that a little bit further? Yeah, as well? that's an excellent question, whoever submitted that. Uh, so OSHA has a recommendation for uh, uh, reusable mat or non-reusable uh, particular face pieces um, based on that. Uh, so the uh, N95 masks or any other just face covering, uh, they recommend that you allow three days between use or wash them. Um, so if you if you had three, let's just say, you could actually put them into a rotation. So you wore one Monday, you set that aside at the end of the day, you use the second one on Tuesday, Set that aside. Use the third one on Wednesday. What that does is they 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 believe at this point, based on the science, uh, that that obviously changes uh, as we know or we've seen. But they believe that within 24 hours to 48 hours, that 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 virus goes away and is dead. Um, and so they add an extra day in there for safety, uh, just for extra measure. Um, so that's that's what OSHA is currently suggesting. If you're going to use like a a rotation and you didn't want to wash them because they're you know they get destroyed when you try to wash them so they're based on that it's one to two days now that, there's a lot of variables in there so it's really hard to say but if you did nothing that's what would happen thanks yep all right last thing i want to wrap up with here and then we'll open it up to questions and answers is um you know what can you do whether you're the uh, the laborer on the site or whether you're the president of the company, um, and this this list is no, in no way uh, uh, something that uh, is proprietary. It's just simply based on our experience. Um, so I've been in safety for a number of years. Uh, you could tell I'm looking a little bit old. Uh, so I've been around for a while. Um, we have several other workers in our our safety groups. We probably have a couple hundred, few hundred years of experience. So this is a group. Uh, sort of compilation of things that we found or think that work or are important. 
Uh, so from the company standpoint, you know, dedicating the appropriate resources. So the, the COVID safety officer is a good example or a full time safety officer when you need them. Uh, a good example of a resource that, you know, it's a personnel resource, but also you know, equipment resources. So both of those things. Uh, effective training. You know, you could achieve the same respirator training or the same confined space training. Uh, you can throw on a 15 minute video or a red vector online training, which we see currently a lot. Uh, or you could have them go out and actually you know, set up the equipment, use it, figure out how to, how to get their hands on it and see what works, what doesn't work and get a lot more out of it. So we'll call that effective training, right? Uh, seeking employee feedback, the, the COVID safety officer and the, the face shield, that, that worked because the employees and the safety person uh, had a good relationship. You know, they weren't afraid or didn't, they felt, they felt like they were gonna be listened to if they brought up that concern. And those employees, uh, you know, responded and told them what's going on, what they think would work, and you know what's happening in, on the in the field. Those, the people doing the work know where the problems are better than anybody. So it'd be crazy to not seek their input. Uh, of course, tailgate meetings. We talked about pencil whipping those types of things and JSAs. Um, you know, recognizing positive behavior. You can see the list there. I'm not going to read all of them, but you know. Many times, for especially safety personnel, we tend to look at the things that people do wrong. Um, and yeah, you know, there's always things that are going on right around you. Uh, so if you can recognize those things and, and maybe reward those, uh, people tend to respond, right? Uh, I don't want to compare it to your to your kids, but uh, you know, if you recognize your kid's behavior and it's good, they'll they'll probably do it again. Uh, so that's a pretty important part, you know, from the company. And then, of course, communicate those changes. So whenever something is positive, it happened, let everybody know. And, and even conversely, negative. Hey, this happened. Yeah, maybe we can learn from that. Try to put a positive spin on it. So that's company things. Uh, I'll, I'll give, I'll open it up and I'm going to continue to speak, but there, there's a spot for others. So I would, I would like to, you know, get some feedback as what other things that you feel that companies can do to maybe help. Uh, prevent fatalities and injuries. Uh, moving on to yourself uh, is, you know, always looking to improve. Uh, I don't think any of us are done learning and we can always uh, do things better. Uh, so we should be looking for those opportunities. Uh, don't be afraid to step in and stop work. Uh, if you do that with the right approach, uh, with the approach that, hey, Jeremy, I'm, I'm, I'm step stepping in because I don't want you to get hurt, right? I'm not trying to be a, a jerk or trying to bust your you know, butt, but uh, I'm concerned about you. So stop work. Uh, reporting hazards when you see them to the right person and you know, not going home at the end of the day telling your wife or your husband that, hey, man, you should have seen how bad it was at work today. I got to report it to people that can do something about it. Uh, same thing with near misses. Uh, not worrying so much about what other, everybody else is doing, you know, looking out for yourself and then helping other people. You know, that new person or that person that maybe is still getting things figured out. And then lastly, you know, having that positive attitude. I think we probably all know somebody that we, uh, yeah, they're kind of, they're kind of uh, contagious. And that can be good or bad, right? So you're around that person, you think, oh, geez, I hate to be around that guy. He's such a, he's such a downer uh, versus that person who's always upbeat and has a good attitude. Uh, that affects our work, that affects everything. Kelly, we did get some responses to uh, to your questions here. If you want to field those, excellent. Um, one was uh, see something, say something. I think that's in in regards to you know reporting those misses or or identifying something and bringing them back to the attention of others. Yeah. Um, Just, that's a real left. good. Uh, that's a you know that's from the Homeland Security Department of Homeland Security, but an excellent uh, saying and something to really live by. You're correct. Whoever wrote that in. Uh, the other one was uh, post project reviews and evaluations. Yeah, very good. We can learn a ton from the uh, things that happen, right? Yep. Um, and I think this one, you know, kind of dovetails into a number of the others, but is uh, stop work authorization and um, enforcing it or use of it. Yeah, um, that support that's that was uh, probably a pretty good oversight on me, my part, uh, having that that company side, having that support, upper level support for those types of things, 
you know, because it does pr affect production. You know, at the end of the day, everybody's a business, right? We got to make money. We've got to get something done. But, you know, you got to have that support whenever somebody does step in and, and stop work. And it does affect that production in most cases. So having yeah. that hire, person higher up saying, yeah, that's good job. Thank you for doing that. Yeah, and Kelly, I think, uh, you know, that one kind of hits home for us, right? We're we're a support service to the industry, to the operators. And, and we've had individuals in the past that have, uh, how do I want to say, been uncomfortable with the use of that stop work order, right? They they feel that they would be reprimanded or or looked at in a negative manner for applying the stop work order. Um, but ultimately, in the end, I think we've gotten positive feedback for the instances where those cards have been been thrown in the past um, and, and appreciated by those clients. So I, I think that's a very valuable note that you know everybody has the ability to make influence here. And, you know, nothing is of too small or too large an issue to bring up at that point. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for for sharing that one. Any others come in? Uh, no, that was all. All right. Well, we're we're uh, I'm, I'm getting down to the end of my time, uh, so we will uh, give you an opportunity to, to type in any questions for a minute or two here. And uh, while that while you're doing that, I will say uh, in advance, Thank you all for your time. I uh, really appreciate the people who uh, stepped up there and, and wrote some comments and asked some questions. Uh, I, I knew looking at that list that we have uh, some really good people on the other end of the line. So, so thanks for doing that. Yeah, and Kelly, I'll I'll help in summation here. You know, to the end of the presentation is that uh, you know safety safety has become paramount uh, not only in our industry but I think just uh, across you know, society as a whole. And we, as we're two, really didn't have a, although we understood safety, we didn't have a hard implementation until about eight to nine years ago. Um, and with that, we brought in, you know, a, a safety group that's extremely robust, extremely experienced um, in, in implementation of these procedures and protocols and plans. Um, and, and for the company, we have strived for the last eight years to, to uphold our, our safety uh, mandates and our goals. And, you know, really didn't start to hit home till two or three years in when people embraced it, right? We, we started to implement some behavior-based type uh, training specifics and involvements. And I think it's made such a huge impact here that people are now not only uh, applying that at work, but we're also getting them applying it at home. You know, we're getting has IDs from people that are submitting things that they did over the weekend in their garden or cleaning out rain gutters or driving, et cetera, um, that have brought that back to our attention. So I think it's, in my mind, it's it's a very positive note to some serious endeavors uh, to see people embrace it in that manner. And, and it can be done. Again, it starts with yourself. Uh, it starts with the company and, and overall as a team. Uh, safety can be a goal, it can be achieved, and it, it can be sought after in the highest of manner. So I, I think that's, for me, a sum of, of where we've been and where we've gone and where, you know, again, we hope to help influence the industry and in getting everybody home to their loved ones, safe and secure every afternoon, every evening, um, and go from there. We did get a couple questions here, Kelly. I'm going to bombard you with these. Okay. Um, Regarding the numbers submitted um, at the beginning of the presentation, yeah. is there any information on what the number one highest occurrence was or, or relative nature, uh, I guess is the way it's presented here, relative nature of what those fatalities or injuries were from? Um, I don't know that oil and gas was broken out separately, but I do know uh, from just general construction um, what the breakdown is and, and falls. Uh, continues to be um, one of the leading, the leading uh, incident, and then um, uh, caught and struck by or between is two. So that includes things like trenches, uh, heavy equipment, like we talked about there. Um, those, so there's one and two for you. Actually, vehicles are still continue to be uh, up there. And actually, that's actually number one. Um, and, I, and I probably should, I should, you know. Uh, reprimand myself for leaving that out because sometimes we forget how dangerous that really is because yeah, we get complacent because we do it all the time but so driving caught between and uh, falls are the are the leading ones in construction right now 
Uh, I have another one here, Kelly. From a fall perspective, uh, what height becomes a critical height from a fall potential? Yeah, if you go by the construction standard, they say six feet, or if there's um, uh, a uh, moving part or hazard underneath you. So if you're over top of a, you know, a piece of equipment, and if you fell into it, you would be uh, chewed up or severely cr critically injured. Then it, then it doesn't matter. It's all the time. Um, if it's uh, other than that, it's six feet uh, in construction for those back at the shop in a general industry type setting. It's four feet. Uh, same thing on that other piece. So if you're over a, d a dangerous piece of equipment, then it's it's all the time. And, and Kelly, this this is for me, I guess, to back that up. Uh, what what's the PPE requirement at that point? Is it is it harness and tie off? It's good you brought that up because it actually doesn't say that. It says that you shall do you shall implement engineering controls if feasible. So that so OSHA uh, requires you if it's feasible to use some kind of cover. Uh, I saw a, an incident happened in Houston last year where two and two individuals died in a, a, a hydro cedar uh, at a high school in Houston, Texas. Um, somebody fell into the uh, a hydro cedar because the guard was off of it and they got overcome by the by the uh, nitrogen, the chemicals in there. And then they, they, they died and then his co-worker went in to get him and he died and they found him about eight hours later when uh, I guess they didn't come home. Uh, but if that guard had been in place, you know, that never would have happened. So, gotcha. So, and, and then at that point, if they can't achieve that, then you have to do a personal fall arrest system, right? So, uh, an anchorage above you, uh, some sort of lanyard, an anchor that's going to hold 5,000 pounds, um, and then enough fall distance there, so high enough above you that you're not going to hit the ground still, and then a full body harness. So, Kelly, you got oh. another one here that uh, mentioned about the, uh, the 911 report in Jason's case study um, what information should be provided or what are critical pieces of information to provide in those 911 calls that's a, that's a really good question so when you call that they're they're trying to figure out who to dispatch so um, you want to provide what has happened right so um, hey i have three individuals who are involved in the car crash uh, what they're what's currently uh, been done for them you know, they're all in serious condition. We haven't done anything yet or, you know, we've got one stabilized. Uh, what their condition is best, you know, um, and where you are, of course. Um, so it, if you provide them with that information, they'll typically keep you on the phone uh, till they get all that information. Uh, if it's a cell phone, it locks in that open position so that you can uh, stay with them. But uh, yeah, those those pieces of information would be critical. So where you are, what's been done, you know, uh, how many people? And I, I think in Jason's case, there is any specialty needs, right? That individual being down in that manhole, yeah. at that distance, there may have they, needed to be some support to to get him out. Or, or if they knew that, uh, they would have sent out. Then there is local uh, uh, personnel there for um, um, technical rescue in the Harrisburg area. Uh, it would have taken a little bit longer to get him there, but you know they would have been much better equipped and trained to be able to, to extract him. Uh, they did a lot of damage to him removing him from that manhole they're lucky to get him out he was actually had bled out by the time they got him loaded into the ambulance uh kelly this was a question of mine um i, I know a while back uh your your ice um contact in your phone heaven forbid you were you know out by yourself <clears throat> as an individual for for ice contact can you provide any any further insight or information is that still valid in the industry and, and a good practice to have logged in your phone yeah, I know the phones all all have uh, some version of that. So yes, that still is valuable information. Uh, also, just on your, you know, the, at your workplace, you know, keeping all your contact information up to date. You know, a lot of times our lives change. We get married or divorced or whatever, and so you still have your your uh, wife three wives ago uh, listed as your next contact. You know, if something happens, and we're trying to tell something that has something happened to Jeremy, uh, that person. Uh, maybe doesn't care less what happens to Jeremy. <laughs> so we want to make sure that that person is uh, is current and valid uh, as well as what's on your phone. Yeah. Thanks, your co-workers too. Excellent. Others? No, sir, that looks to have uh, have wrapped it up uh, for questions that have been submitted through the, uh, the Q&A portion here. Uh, again, I'm going to reiterate, as, as Kelly said initially, thank you all for your attendance. We are going to go ahead and wrap up a couple minutes early. 
Um, should you, you know, have any questions after or, or further uh, interest in speaking with Kelly, his contact information is still there on the screen. I know Kelly doesn't sleep much these days, so he's available morning, noon and night. Feel free to reach out to him. And again, from the, the Rotu team here, greatly appreciate your attendance. Have a safe and happy weekend coming up here and 4th of July is coming up as well. Stay safe if you go out on the water. Boating's a big option these years. Yeah, thank you everyone. Thanks again.